Hi, I'm Cheryl Kagan, very proud to be the Senator for Gaithersburg and Rockville. Welcome to this week's edition of Kibitzing with Kagan, brief conversations with people I find fascinating. With me today is Montgomery County Police Officer Jamie Derbyshire, a drug recognition expert and someone I've worked with for a number of years now. Officer Derbyshire, welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat. Thank you so much for having me. I really am looking forward to this and for, to being here today. Good. Well, we have a lot to cover. I've already warned you that I have a ton of notes. And my goal here is to really educate our viewers about impaired driving and about being a police officer. So let's start with your childhood. When did you decide you wanted to be a police officer? Were there any childhood role models, anyone in your family? Where'd you grow up? Like, Give us the trajectory. Sure. Yeah. So I grew up in Fairfax County. Um, a number of my family members lived in Montgomery County. So I was familiar with Maryland, but really Virginia is my my home. Um, but uh, there weren't, all my family members were very much business oriented. So my mother had her own company, same with my, my father, everyone was very business minded. And so no one in law enforcement. So that was sort of something that I didn't really think about until um, probably it was time to go out and get a job, actually. And so I was, um, I went to University of Maryland in College Park and was an English major. English major, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's so, very cool. Yeah, so uh, not really thinking about law enforcement then. And probably it wasn't until I actually uh, made the decision to to become a, a police officer that I really knew what the job was about. So I think I kind of went in there pretty blindly. Um, but it's given me a lot of appreciation for the general community and for how the majority of the world lives and sort of the problems that that are out there. And so I think it's um, made me more appreciative of what I've had, but also uh, more wanting to give back as well to others in our community as a whole. Amazing. So I think it's probably fair to say that uh, police departments are still pretty male dominated. What was the, your training like, uh, the police academy? And 20 years ago, what was the rough percentage of women in the department versus now? That's a good question. So as far as how many women we had in the department 20 years ago, I know that we had a class of 81, which was huge compared to what we have going into the academy now. We are, like you said, really hurting for law enforcement out there. So I think our current class is a little over 20. Wow. Um, yeah, so we had 81. We were one of the largest classes. And I think out of those 81, we had 11 to 12 female officers um, total. And that's not just Montgomery County, but we were the majority of it because we had some from uh, Park Police and from Rockville City and the Sheriff's Department as well. So, um, but again, that gives you an idea of sort of the ratio there. You know, there were 11 to 12 of us and then the rest were all, all males. And now has it have the numbers improved they, increased at all they have I, I definitely think they have um and there's definitely been um a shift lately i think to women police a lot differently than than men in a lot of ways and so um in some ways that's really good and um you know it's it definitely adds to the profession as a whole so say more about that How um you police differently i think uh you know there's a lot of of talking a lot of conversation, probably more than action. There's only so much. I think women naturally tend to be, you know, more talkative anyway. But um, you're talking about with the general public. You're not talking about with each other. Uh, I think with the general public, yes. Okay. So probably with each other as well. But I was mainly referencing the uh, the general public. And I think that, um, you know, a lot of the ways that we look for solutions just differ than uh, males. It just is the way that it is. Um, there's, you know, we're not going to fight people. It's really, we've got to work with, you know, uh, areas and how we communicate, how we speak to people in general to get our points across. And so it just, it just looks different as far as policing goes between how most men and women police. So part of the reason for the steep decline in applicants started around the time of COVID and then we had the whole defund the police and um, and Blue Lives Matter and all of that um, and all of the horrific police involved murders. Um, why don't you talk about what that was like for you to go through, to watch and to be affected by? Um, it, it was a, a difficult time for certain. 
Um, at the time, a lot of us were, um, our duties had changed a little bit, especially those of us in specialized units, um, such as mine that just really does impaired driving. Um, a lot of things had changed as far as our reporting requirements to work and sort of, um, you know, there was concern about COVID and what that was going to look like if it uh, ran rampant through a shift, you know, what backup officers that they would need. And so um, a lot of us, our status was changed a little bit so that we would be readily available to be called in uh, should a whole shift get wiped out with COVID and um, and have to stay home and be forced to quarantine. And so um, it's, uh, but instead of being called in for, for COVID, we were fortunate in that our officers stayed healthy and took uh, normal precautions in order to protect themselves. But um, we were called in for the riots instead and for looting and for a lot of um, community issues and, and unrest. And so that was difficult. And um, I think it was probably one of the first times in my life that I didn't really um, love my job, you know, as far as that goes. Um, when I left home putting on my uniform and my kids were crying, saying that people hate you because they're burning police cars and they want to kill you, uh, you know, I really question, is this worth it? you know, because um, it's really causing a lot of problems. And, you know, my kids were understandably upset because that's what they were seeing. That's what they were hearing. And so that that made those times really difficult. Yeah, I can't imagine. Um, well, let's pivot to your department and your initiative, because that's how we've worked together. Um, so impaired driving and impairment, impairment by drugs and alcohol. Let's start briefly with alcohol, even though you are a drug recognition expert, but people know about DUI, driving under the influence or DWI, driving while uh, impaired. Why don't you just talk about driving while intoxicated? Um, why don't you talk about those and the methods used for detecting Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So we've been very fortunate in that we've had research done on alcohol impaired driving for decades. And so we have a very good understanding as far as how alcohol impairs and which field tests are validated and reliable that we can use in order to determine someone who is impaired as opposed to someone who is not. Um, oftentimes you'll hear about that blood alcohol content and that 0.08 uh, standard that we're looking for. And so a lot of our field testing that we do um, is is focused on that that standard. So it's nice. We have a very clear cut number. Uh, if the person is a 0.08 or higher, then they are legally impaired and it makes our job quite easy um, in a lot of ways. And we have those nice, uh, we have a three test uh, battery of tests that we do roadside that um, you know are very reliable. Uh, having to do with looking at the eyes, someone walking a straight line, and then standing on one foot. So again, all validated, very easy as far as uh, determination with someone who may be impaired by alcohol. So that's that's alcohol in a nutshell, and it it's fairly easy. Okay, so I'm on a prescription drug. I'm tired. I'm I'm having a epileptic seizure. I'm. How can you tell the difference between that and I drank too much at the party? So definitely odor of alcoholic beverage coming from someone's breath is huge. Bloodshot, watery eyes, also another great general indicator for alcohol impairment. It does get a little bit trickier with your tolerant alcoholics. They can function quite well at very high uh, levels of alcohol in their blood. Um, but you learn to look for other indicators. And we train all of our officers, and I think it's a state mandate now, that all officers in the state actually receive uh, drug or alcohol impaired driving, and it includes some drug impaired driving as well while they're in the academy. So they have a very good understanding even upon graduation as to what to look for and what that looks for. And some of that training involves medical impairment as well. So like you had suggested epilepsy or someone who's uh, having a diabetic episode often can look like a drunk driver. So they are all trained as to what that looks like and what they should be expecting to see if someone is undergoing one of those as opposed to alcohol impairment. Before we shift to drug impairment, how did you get into this? Were you asked? Was it, did you initiate it? Um, as far as impaired driving goes, I just always had an interest in it. It's usually people, there's so many people that are affected by, um, you know, drunk drivers. And usually they'll say one in three people have had a drunk driver affect them in their lives at some point. And if you think about the number of people across our nation that die every year, it's over 10,000 people that drive from 
died from alcohol impaired driving incidents. So it's it's crazy. So I think um, I had an interest in it. I worked a lot of evenings. And so it was something to do. And I enjoyed it. And then thinking about how it affected our community. And it was one of the proactive things as police officers that we can do. We're, we're so reactionary. We respond to the robbery, we resp respond to the burglary. But, you know, um, as far as a lot of our alcohol or drug impaired driving, it's something that you actually have to look for and make an effort. And so it's, you know, it's proactive as opposed to all those reactionary things that we often do. Did it take extra training for you? And was it even available when you started that work? It was available. We have good training out there. So we have the training that I spoke of in the academy for the field test that we all get. And then they have another training and we call it A-RIDE. It's Advanced Roadside Impaired Driving Enforcement or Education. And we, uh, through that, it's kind of a stepping stone from the alcohol to the drug impairment. And so I took that class and then we have what you've referenced some, the drug recognition expert or the DRE class, as we call it, um, which is a much longer, more in-depth class, uh, takes a number of months and a huge uh, exam at the end of it in order to be able to qual be qualified that we do as well. So um, I definitely took an interest in, and sought out those classes in order to expand my expertise, I guess. And how many DREs, how many drug recognition experts are there certified in Montgomery County, in the state of Maryland, and does every state have them? Are they nationally? So they are nationally and up to Canada as well. So Canada has a very large contingent of DREs as well, especially once they legalize cannabis mm -hmm. in Canada. Mm -hmm. um, as far as Montgomery County goes, we have it's usually around 15 to 20. Um, we kind of get some and then may lose one or two for uh, promotions. Um, but usually around that 15 to 20 mark. So we have a lot for- Out of, um, give, an, give an idea, how many Montgomery County officers? 15 to 20 out of? Out of, well, we have, on a good day, we have 1,200 sworn. Right. So it's still a very small percentage, but as far as looking at other counties in the state, we have uh, some of the most DREs in our county, which is which is good. But um, every, county, every county has at least one or no? No, not every county, but um, most of the counties have at least one uh, but there are plenty that that don't. And the state police, Maryland State Police has a huge number. So they often are able to help out in counties that don't particularly have one with their assigned agency. Interesting. And okay. then you asked about the state. So I think we have just under 200 um, DREs throughout the entire state. Okay. So let's shift to drugs. Um, and we're going to go deep into cannabis since that just was um, adult use, recreational use was just legalized on July 1st of this year, 2023. But let's go back first, medical cannabis. Um, so you had already been trained. You were ready for this. Tell me what you saw, what you did, um, and what you saw in terms of you know impaired driving on the roadways. So when medical first came about, we didn't really have uh, the points of sales that we have now. So it's really once the dispensaries opened that we really saw that increase in impaired driving with relation to cannabis. I will say that a number of our cannabis uh, consumers that are um, medicinally certified, that they actually are, are very responsible with their usage. And so it's really not so much our medical patients that we're seeing, and, and there have been some, but generally speaking, it's those who we're using prior to adult uh, legalization, prior to July 1, that right. we're, um, you know, consuming too much and getting in the vehicles and driving and ending up in a crash or ending up, you know, stopped by one of us. Right. So we have seen, we have seen an increase, but really once the suspensories open, we've seen more so. And then uh, we're still trying to figure out what we're seeing now since July 1 wasn't very long ago. Right. So, um, even though your other police officers are not going to get to the level of a drug recognition expert, you still want them to be able to identify impairment on the road. Uh, and I was grateful for the opportunity to attend one of the sessions you held when we watched people get high and uh, and lots of chips around, <laughs> lots of munchies, and then and then they were tested. Talk through um, what you were trying to educate your, your colleagues on the police force. Absolutely. So um, our dispensaries, the first ones opened up in December of 2017. By 2018, we had approached then our chief, uh, Tom Manger, um, about doing what we call, exactly, about doing what we call a, a green lab or cannabis impairment intoxication driving lab. 
And so essentially, we were uh, hoping to bring people in that were medically certified to use cannabis, and we would have them dose twice throughout that evening. And then we would be able to teach our officers uh, what to look for with regard to general indicators of impairment. So it was great because it was a controlled environment and a safe setting. Um, it also was fantastic for that community engagement part because obviously two groups, the law enforcement and the cannabis community, not always you know, interacting on a positive level with one another. Right. So it allowed for that positive interaction and for us both to learn from one another. They learned a little bit about uh, the dangers of driving impaired and what we were looking for. And they taught us a little bit about where they were coming from and gave us some insight as far as usage goes and and just products um, and implements that they used to consume. So a great learning environment for both, but really we wanted to help our officers be able to understand the cannabis laws uh, better because they were changing so quickly. Um, and mainly so that we were benefiting the officers by not tying up their time with you know questions uh, when they were roadside and same with our cannabis consumers as well, saving them time so that if they were stopped, and they were consuming responsibly that they would quickly be allowed to go on their way once they were determined not to be impaired. So really just that confidence roadside and understanding roadside is what we were looking for through those, those cannabis labs. Right. Uh, talk about the oral swab, if you would, and just the detection methods. You talked about the three methods, um, the whether it's alcohol, the eyes, the uh, step and turn, the balance on one foot. What's the equivalent for cannabis? So all of those tests have not been validated for cannabis, but we do use them and they are all divided attention tests. And cannabis does have an ability to uh, make divided attention tests difficult for individuals. So they're reliable and they're good tests. Um, we have some other tests that we learned through that class that I talked about earlier, um, that stepping stone between the alcohol and the drug class. Um, and those tests are even more reliable for cannabis impairment, really helps improve accuracy and specificity if we include those tests roadside. And some of those are eye tests. Um, and yeah, or we have one called lack of convergence where they kind of go in a circle around their face and bring the uh, the stimulus in towards towards their nose and we see if they can cross their eyes right. um, and they can hold it there. Exactly. But that's a very good one for cannabis uh, as well. Um, we look for body tremors or eyelid tremors, also something that is often seen with cannabis usage. So there are certain tests that we can teach that will not really prolong the period of time roadside, but will help add um, insight to what the officer is seeing. So whether they're lacking it or they have it, it's going to help them make a decision uh, as far as impairment goes as well. So we have those tests, but we also have, like you had mentioned, or we hope to have, <laughs> um, oral fluid testing. And so oral fluid testing is um, essentially, there's a device that has a oral fluid swab. You actually hand it to the driver so they're able to perform their own test and they move it around their mouth, on the sides of their cheeks, under their tongue, wherever they can collect saliva. And then there's a roadside test that within five to nine minutes determines if they've met a certain threshold of a certain drug category. So that also is a very nice test to be able to have because it's really not dependent on the officer, officer's observations, but more so on the testing device itself and a threshold level. So I used to describe it as, you know, sticking a Q-tip in and just kind of doing this. And it's a, it's a small device, you stick it in and then a few minutes later, it prints out a piece of paper um, with eight to 12, eight to 11 different drugs. So cocaine, methamphetamines, Go through the give a yeah. give a opioid PC, PCP um, cannabis um, and it is a it's actually that grouping of drugs is dependent on the manufacturer of the device so which device you're using how big the panel is but it also is a software based system so you could remove drugs on there that maybe weren't as reliable as you would want so benzodiazepines are one that um, that don't partition as well into the oral fluid so that would be one that might be worth thinking about hey let's not have that on there. But generally what they're seeing is is false negatives as opposed to false positives on those. So really it's in the favor of the driver uh, for for most cases. And they're very reliable, very accurate, and not intrusive like blood tests. And being used other places. This is not totally new and untried. Absolutely. There's a lot of states that use them, you know, in addition to or um, you know, as opposed to blood because of that, you know, that being not as intrusive as, as taking blood. So Alabama has a very robust program that they use 
Um, and so do other countries for that matter. Australia does more than, and I think they do like half a million of oral fluid tests per year. So a huge amount. So they're definitely being relied upon, not just in our country, but outside. We're not always looking at Alabama as the role model, but good for them. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, now that we've all been through COVID with sticking the Q-tip in our nose, sticking it in our mouth just doesn't seem like such a big deal, right? No, it's easy. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, uh, so July 1st, adult use became legal. Talk about what we, what we've seen in other states in terms of an uptick in crashes, in roadside more fatalities. Absolutely. So Colorado is probably our best example, mainly because they've legalized on all levels, uh, you know, uh, and have had it that way for a significant amount of time at this point. They we also do at all levels, just clear. as far as um, so they decriminalize cannabis and then they did medicinal legalization and then adult use or recreational legalization as well. Yeah. So they've kind of been able to experience all those phases, which is what we're going through now, you know. Um, and uh, so they actually put out a report, a yearly report that talks about different things. I love it because it talks about traffic first, but it also talks about um, increase in use, public safety, the effects it's had on hospitals, um, even tox screens for suicides, what they found with regard to that, um, you know, minor uh, exposure that our minors or younger population has uh, once it's legalized. So um, that report uh, is is a fantastic report. And some of the things that they're saying as far as traffic goes, since recreational legalization, they found a 138% increase in positivity rates for drivers who have tested positive for fatal crashes with regard to cannabis in their system. So, so sorry. So okay. somebody dies, you're testing the dead person and the driver, if the, or if the driver is the dead person, you're testing. You're test okay. Yeah. You're testing the driver in that case. Um, and so that's what they're finding is, is cannabis involvement. Um, there has been a, a little over 20% increase in, in fatal crashes during that time anyway. So I want to be fair and not just say it's all cannabis. There's been an increase across the board, but that they're attributing 138% increase for uh, cannabis in drivers. And what have they done as a, as a result? Are they using oral swab or other means, other methods? So I um I don't know exactly what they've done, so I wouldn't want to speak to it just because I don't want to give that information. Um, and I don't know if they're using oral fluid testing or, or not in Colorado at this point. Okay. Um, um so, go ahead. Were you gonna say something else? And I was just gonna say that, and it makes sense, some of the other things that they looked at as far as increase in use. So I think they are currently ranked ranked third or fourth nationally in uh cannabis consumption. Um, so it, it makes sense that you make it legal and it's out there and more readily available. So you're going to see that increase as well. So, um, public educating the public is a key, a key tool that, so if you had a magic wand, how would, what would you want the state of Maryland to do to get the word out about impaired driving? I'm fine. I've only had just a little and I'm, you know, I mean, same thing with dri with driving after having a drink or two or three. Yeah, I think um, any, any media outlets or any sources that we can get across, especially within the cannabis community, it's so important for them to come out and say, that there's danger in driving high or even after just consuming a little bit. So even if they don't feel high, you know, that they should be really careful when it comes to driving because as police officers, we're always saying, don't do this, don't do that. And so when you have someone from inside, from the cannabis community saying, hey, really think twice before consuming and driving, that's more helpful than us going out and saying it. I of course love the billboards. I finally drove by one yesterday um, on 15 that talked about driving high and, you know, please don't consume cannabis and drive high. So anything like that is extremely important. Mm -hmm. um, our cannabis labs, you know, I think uh, it's not just Montgomery County anymore that are doing them. Uh, Maryland State Police have done some, Frederick City Police did one. And um, so the more that we can do those labs and get out into the community, I think, I think the better. But I think one of the things that's important to point out is a lot of people are saying, they want to liken cannabis to alcohol. And a lot of people say, well, it's safer than driving drunk. But my question is, is it safer than driving sober? So I think that's the biggest question that I'd like them to ask 
each other or themselves if they're consuming is, is it safer than driving sober? I would take the sober person, you know, any day of the week, even as opposed to a tolerant user who's taken one or two hits off a joint 30 minutes prior. Right. I just, so yeah, that's, that's what I'd like them to just ask themselves is, you know, considering safer, what are we talking about when we're talking about safer? You referenced blood test. I think you have to go back to that. And then the other thing is, what are the consequences of somebody who has been found to be uh, driving while impaired under the influence Absolutely. of drugs? Absolutely. So um, as far as um, the consequences, I'll do that first because it's easier. Mm -hmm. um, they're exactly the same as driving under the influence of alcohol. So they would get equivalent of a, a DUI charge, so driving under the influence charge. Um, and it, it kind of falls in our traffic article, just like the alcohol impaired driving goes. So fairly severe. Uh, they would definitely have to go to court. It would definitely uh, cost some money as far as attorneys and court costs um, go. So that would be something to to consider and get out there as well. Um, as far as a uh, blood test, when we an officer is roadside and they determine that it's not alcohol and that it's most likely drugs, they're asked the individual is arrested and taken back to the police station where the drug recognition expert comes in. At the end of that uh, process, the drug recognition expert will run through a series of tests. At the end of the process, they're asked, the individual is asked to submit to a uh, test of uh, blood. So they would be taken to the hospital and the blood test would be done at that point. Um, if they were to agree, they don't have to agree, but there are consequences administratively for their driver's license if they refuse. And so, um, that's something to be considered of as, as well. But that's where the, the blood test would come in. The DRE or the drug recognition exam stands alone without a tox screen. So a lot of people think, oh, well, they won't go forward with charges without the blood test, but they absolutely will. And we often do. So it's not the be all end all. Um, the tox screen just confirms you know, our findings, um, but there's plenty of things we don't test for. So there's times where uh, it doesn't come back in the tax screen and the charges still stand. So it's it's a slippery slope, but um, one I wouldn't want to be on as a driver. Right. You have joined me in testifying a number of times uh, for legislation, DUID, driving under the influence of drugs. Uh, talk about what that's been like as a police officer. Just briefly give us a sense and, uh, you know, which if if there would be one law that you would like to strengthen or change. What would you like to see the folks in Annapolis? What would you like to see us do? That is definitely a hard question. <laughs> I think um, I've it's been an honor and a pleasure, uh, absolutely, because I think it's been like seven years now. Um, <laughs> so that's a long time. Yeah. It has been a long time, but um, I'm very appreciative, and it does give me different insight as far as you know what's going on and and um, you know how much of a difference those laws make for our job and for the general public as well and how much impact they have. Um, if I had to pick one, mm -hmm. you probably won't like my answer. Okay. <laughs> um, I, would, I would like more mandatory minimum laws for mm. impaired driving because it's very sad right now going into court and seeing the leniency there. And I think that if the general community understood the dangers better, or even just the consequences were harsher, and I, I'm not one that's into penalties, but I do think that there's a place for it because we've become as a society so accepting of alcohol impaired driving. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a serious problem. And so if people had more consequences, because it isn't, um, it isn't often that people go into court and are are concerned about what's going to happen. We have people who have four, five, six, ten DUIs, and they're still all misdemeanors, and they're still committing the offense. And so, I think the mandatory minimums would be would be helpful. Um, and then, of course, I always want the oral fluid right to, right. to go forward. So that, of course, is my other one. But uh, as far as what would have a a big impact that I think would be extremely important would be those mandatory minimums. We have to start to wrap up, um, but I still have a bunch of questions. I need to give a shout out to Emily Keller, the uh, Moore Miller Administration Special Secretary on Opioid, um, and the former mayor of Hagerstown. Uh, I don't know whether you've had much of a chance to work with her or know her yet, but she's great. Um, so you got a sentence or two on anything you've seen in the last six, seven months in terms of change in the administration? 
Um, I think we've seen positive things, uh, um, you know, across the board. So I'm appreciative of of that. Um, and I think we just need to keep up the good work. I think July 1 is going to, um, you know, we'll see some consequences of that in the future. Um, and I'm curious as to how they'll be handled and but hopeful. Yes. So, Officer Derbyshire, you have been recognized for your amazing work. Uh, is statewide, the Outstanding Innovative Program Award, the Kevin Quinlan Award for Excellence in Traffic Safety on your work on impaired drivers. What are your goals for the future for your work and for uh, for the efforts to keep our roadway safe? Yeah, I think my goals for the future are to keep doing what we're doing. I think that anything that uh, brings you know impaired driving, whether it be alcohol or drugs, into the limelight. Um, just to get the focus on it is is positive. Um, so I'll continue to do my green labs. We've actually had uh, numerous states come to our green labs now. And so our Montgomery County model is actually being implemented in Ohio, in Connecticut. We've had a number of agencies from Virginia come up to our labs. We have New Jersey that's going to be coming down in uh, at the end of September. So I really think that just kind of spreading the word and kind of getting that good training venue out there, that community engagement uh, with regard to those training venues is all extremely important. And so kind of keep doing what I'm doing and hope for the best and uh, hopefully come and join you all up in Annapolis some more and, you know, make some positive changes. That's awesome. Um, before we go to the fast five officer, um, will you tell us a little bit, and I don't want to shift too much, but in addition to your really heroic work uh, in law enforcement, um, you've also been a foster parent. Do you want to speak briefly about that? And I don't want to get too much in your business, but I think it's so important to uh, educate people about the importance and the impact you can have. Yeah, absolutely. So um, for two years, we've fostered uh, older children. So those who are probably nine and older that are less likely to get adopted through a nonprofit organization called Kids Save. And this organization brings uh, children from Colombia to the United States. To be clear, Colombia, the country, sorry. not Colombia, Maryland. Exactly, to be okay. clear. Yes. <laughs> the country. And um, they bring them over for a period of usually about five weeks during the summertime in hopes of finding them prospective adoptive families. And so it's a fantastic opportunity for these children. Um, we've fostered four total. And... Um, it's been it's been an experience, but a good one and positive. And now all of the ones that we have fostered have actually been adopted. Um, so Indeed. it's yeah, positive ending. So it's great. And adopted in Maryland, or so. Um, so the one group that we uh, fostered, they were a sibling set of three. So we had six kids in the house uh, one summer for five weeks. It was really busy, <laughs> and um, uh -huh. they were adopted to a family outside of St. Louis. Okay. And then um, the first child that we had, he was adopted to a family in Florida. Amazing. That's yeah. so wonderful. Thank you for that. Yeah. So let's pivot. Uh, fast five, five quick questions, five quick answers. Officer Jamie Derbyshire, Montgomery County drug recognition expert. First, question number one. Uh, who is a police character that you see on TV or in the movies that you think is most accurate or most inspiring to you? Oh my goodness. I don't watch that much TV. Is that horrible? It's not horrible. Okay. <laughs> um, I really don't. So can I come back to that one at the end? Sure. Sure. All right. I used to love Cagney and Lacey and Starsky and Hutch and some of those, you know, some of those folks. Yeah. Um, all right. You, question number two. You deal with crime and drugs and just hard stuff all the time. Uh, what makes you laugh? So my family, I mean, I'm, I'm very close to my family. So I have three kids. And uh, so they're probably uh, the source of my humor and inspiration and all of that. So they make me laugh a lot. Um, but I also, um, I love animals and horses. And so I ride horses a bunch. And so that that is an outlet as well that makes me happy. Well, that might be the answer to question number three. I was going to ask, since you kind of are always on, what do you do to get off the grid? What do you do to really get law enforcement out of your brain? Yeah, so being the English major that I am, I love to read. So I read when I can, and that helps. And usually nothing law enforcement related or crime related, just some novel, you know, well-written novel, some of the classics. 
um, and then riding horses. And I play, I play soccer regularly in Montgomery County and in Frederick County, probably about three times a week. Fantastic. Good for yeah. you. Um, question number four, what is your proudest accomplishment? Um, in work or in life? I left it vague. Um, I can do both. So my children are my proudest in, in life in general. And then in work, um, you know, I, I'm kind of a busy person, so I like to do new things and I get bored fairly easily. So the green labs are my proudest accomplishment so far, but I think there will be others because I still have at least five years before I retire. So, um, you know, I'm banking on another one coming into the mix at some point. Love that. <laughs> And question number five, the question I ask everyone, Officer Jamie Derbyshire, what is your hidden secret superpower? What's a skill or talent you have, something you're really good at that most folks can't do? Um, so my secret superpower is probably, I mean, I probably riding. I rode professionally for a long time before I was a police officer. And so, and it's not something I talk about often. Once I had kids, I don't do it as much, but I can still ride pretty well. So I would say that's probably my my hidden talent. And again, that's horseback riding, not just it's riding in a car. Or no. <laughs> no, I don't like riding in a car that much. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, Officer Derbyshire, I have loved working with you and learning from you. And I'm really grateful for your taking time to chat and for all of the ways that you serve the public. It's good to be with you today. Thank you. And likewise with you as well. And I look forward to many more years. So um, thank you for having me today. It was an honor and a pleasure. Good. I'll look forward to seeing you soon. Take care. You too. Bye.